This is the Hiking Through Life podcast. We've all been gifted a journey called life. Let's see where the journey leads us today. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast, where we talk with people who in some way, shape, or form have been influenced by the outdoors. I'm Andy, the producer of this podcast, and my lovely wife, Sarah, will be your host. Together, we make up Hiking Through Life. This podcast is all about bringing all kinds of people who are inspired by the outdoors and sharing their stories. We hope that by sharing people's stories, it inspires others to get out and live a more meaningful life. Tune in every week for new episodes, or better yet, subscribe to the Hiking Through Life podcast on your favorite podcast provider. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Also, if you have a story to share or know of anyone who might be interested in being a guest on this podcast, head on over to hikingthroughlife.net slash podcast and get in touch with us. Now sit back and enjoy this week's episode. We've been talking to educators and outdoor families on the podcast recently, and I'm super excited to have our guest on the podcast today. Today, we are joined on the podcast by Anna Dukey. Anna is an advocate for outdoor learning and nature play for children. With her passion, she works for the Jeffers Pond Nature School and started the Minnesota Early Childhood Outdoors Group. Welcome to the podcast, Anna. We're super excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. So tell us about your own outdoor background and how outdoor education came about for you. Yeah, so I grew up um, with my parents had a mindset of sending us outside. I have three siblings. And so we spent most of our time playing in our backyard and in the local neighborhood. And it was very much that mindset of get outside, don't come back home until the dinner bell rings. We actually literally had a old farm bell that my mom put on the side of the house and she would ring that. And wherever we were in the neighborhood, we would head home for dinner. And that was our cue that we needed to come back. That's my time outside playing. We were exploring. There's a little tiny of my childhood memory of it is a forest, but it's not a forest. It's this little quarter acre, if even that, of woods um, that bordered a road. And then there was a drainage pond there. So we spent a lot of time over there. The rule was is we couldn't go by the water. So that was my mom's uh, kind of a fear that she had or worry. Um, so it was that trust with us that we wouldn't go by the water. And of course, we would end up by the water and she would find ways of knowing that we were by the water. And one of my favorite stories is my two brothers, my younger brother ended up in the water. I can't remember what happened, but he ended up in the pond and came home. They tried to hose him off at a neighbor's house as much as they could get the pond scum off of him. And they showed up at the house and my mom said, where were you? And the two of them had made up a story that they were riding bikes and going through a big puddle. And so my brother had gotten wet from this big puddle. So she said, looked at him and said, get in the car and show me where this puddle is. So they drove around the neighborhood three or four times looking for any possible puddle that could be that where they were playing. And then finally they knew they had to fess up. That they were in the pond. So she had that trust, but she had ways of monitoring us. And it was from other neighborhoods, our neighbors watching where we were and, you know, kind of they'd have communication with each other. And so they knew each other. And so they were all watching out for us and, and making sure that the children were safe, even if we weren't um, playing with children of theirs or they didn't even have children. It was that kind of group community monitoring. And um, she would also do the drive by. And now I remember the minivan that would occasionally come by or linger. And it was my mom would be checking up on us and just uh, staying distance, but just following up on us to make sure we were being safe and everything was okay. But, but it was that trust. So I grew up with that kind of childhood. And then um, I went to St. Olaf College and going into science, I knew I wanted to do that. So I got my, uh, started in the biology studies and I realized really quickly, I didn't want to be in a lab. So I liked the field work aspect of being outside, but I didn't like the follow-up, which was majority of what happens in science is of the lab work. And so I did an internship with Dodge Nature Center for the summer as a naturalist. And from that, I learned about their Dodge Nature Center preschool. That ended up kind of shifting my mindset to thinking about education. So when I graduated, worked at Como Zoo as an informal educator. And then in that time, I really got hooked on the early childhood and realized that that was my passion, was the early childhood education. So I went back to the school at the University of Minnesota while I was working and got my early childhood license. And then uh, from there, I ended up in Big Lake for one year in kind of a traditional um, 
preschool setting, and then I went down to Prior Lake Savage Area Schools, which has a E-STEM focus. So the first E is environmental studies, and then um, the STEM, so they integrated that. So I was excited to kind of bridge my uh, passion for being outside with, with early childhood education. Yeah, I love that you didn't even initially go to school for education right away. It was just kind of like molded through your own experiences, which is the best way for people to really discover what they want to do. Because I feel like when you when you go to college at like age 18, 19, it's like you're determining what you're doing the rest of your life. No, you need to like go have some field experience first. No, that's exactly right. And yeah, my family has a background in education and I was like, nope, I would done different things growing up. My mom ran the school church daycare and Sundays. And so we started that when I was in fourth grade and every Sunday we'd go do childcare for two of their masses and um, summer camp programs and things like that. But it was determined not to be, it was like, no, education, I don't want to do education. And I think it was just my mindset of that formal traditional education. And that's not what I connected with. And so finding a different way to do it was really neat to be able to find that experience and process. Yeah. So that totally reminds me right now too. Have you read the book or heard of the book? There's no such thing as bad weather. Yes. Yeah. That is a perfect book. Yes. So perfect. I talked to that author a few weeks back. Oh, you did? Yes, I did. She lives in Sweden. Um, but yeah, she was in the USA. She sent her kids to a USA preschool for a few years and realized, I don't want this traditional schooling system. I'm going back to Sweden to have outdoor schooling. So she is back. I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that. I thought she was still in the US. So she is back in Sweden. That's, you know, it is, it's that what we kind of associate with education. And then you realize that there's other options out there. And once you realize there are some other um, methods of teaching and structure, and it's hard to go back to that traditional mindset and, and methods. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And I mean, I'm sure the families that come to your school. So before we get into that, let's talk about the school that you work at Jeffers Pond. Tell us a little bit about that school. So Jeffers Pond is one of the elementary schools in Prior Lake. Prior to preschool being moved in, it was a K-5 elementary school. We do have an early childhood learning center in Prior Lake, and that's called Edgewood School, and that's actually where I started. So I did one year of traditional schooling, or kind of traditional preschool at Edgewood School, and in that time, the district was transitioning to that environmental STEM initiative. So they had previously had the environmental education was a big piece of their, their schooling and their uh, philosophy, but then they were adding the STEM component. So I was able to be on some curriculum committees for that. And as part of that, the conversation shifted to what, what does this look like in early childhood education? Or, and at that point, um, early childhood still hadn't fully integrated in with the environmental education initiative that the rest of the elementary schools were, were doing. It was kind of primarily the K-5 that had this environmental education component. There was little pieces in the preschool, but not not that full integration. So um, the supervisor at the time, my principal had came up to me and said, um, what do you think about a nature-based preschool? Is that something that you'd be interested in possibly pursuing and developing for the district? And I obviously jumped right on board. That's exactly what I was hoping uh, to be able to do is eventually get to an, be in a nature preschool. So um, I started kind of learning more. I had known a little bit about Dodge Nature Center. I had that kind of naturalist teaching experience in the informal setting. The main thing out there at that time was just books and connecting with others that were already doing it. So I did that. I reached out to people that I knew that were at Dodge and um, sort of reading some more books and things like that. And we created a plan for developing this program. So the next year it started at Edgewood and it has this little quarter acre of um, what was kind of a butterfly garden, but it was mostly just a green space that was surrounded by some butterfly plants and then hosta, mainly hosta plants. And so we developed that into a nature play space. So we brought in lots of natural materials, created a, a dig pit, a mud kitchen. Um, we brought in rocks and logs for the kids to balance on and rocks for them to move around. And we headed out to see, kind of just started to watch the children in that space. And we ended up spending most of our day, about two and a half hours, it was a half day program. And we spent most of that time day after day in that little space and that was enough. And so it was really neat to have that opportunity because even for me as in growing up, the forest in my imagination, even though it really wasn't that, 
I really associated nature and those wild spaces as being something that you had to have in order to do a nature-based preschool. But at Edgewood School, it, it just simply wasn't there. And so to see that and experience that you could do a nature-based preschool in that type of environment was eye-opening for me and a kind of a, a really powerful experience because it got me back to what the core of nature-based education is, which is really providing children with an opportunity to interact with their environment, whatever it may be, but their local community environment. So kind of being innovative and being creative with that. So in that first year, we ended up doing, um, I think it was weekly or every two weeks we would do on a field trip to have the families drop off at one of our other school sites, in these elementary schools that have these big outdoor learning areas. So there's actually three schools in Prior Lake that have a considerable amount of space. So it was um, McCall Pond, which is a community park in Savage. We would go there. The Five Hawks Elementary has a nice outdoor learning area, school forest, Minnesota school forest. And then Jeffers Pond has 80 acres of land adjacent to the school. And it has a connection with the Minnesota Jeffers Foundation. And that's actually how the foundation got started is they had this land that they received from the gentleman that had passed away and they created this foundation in his memory, in his honor. And so they sold most a lot of the land for development and then they preserved this 80 acres of land for environmental education purposes. And then they sold a small area right next to it to the school district to build Jeffers Pond. So the next year, um, as Prior Lake has been growing in enrollment, so spacing was becoming more limited at, at Edgewood School. So they had the opportunity to offer uh, me the chance to, to explore the opportunity to go to Jeffers Pond. So I agreed to do that. And uh, we started a half day program at Jeffers Pond the first year, and then that went to a full day program. So now we have two full day sections. What year did you start that? Fall of 2014 is when we started the first year of nature preschool. Okay. And yeah, like, I mean, it sounds like you had some good other preschools to collaborate with at the time, but do you feel like over the past, like five, 10 years, like outdoor preschool has really like exploded in our state? It definitely has. Yeah. I mean, when I started, I would say there was maybe five that I knew of, but several kind of were started right around that same time that we were starting our nature preschool in, at Prior Lake. So it was, you know, Dodge Nature Center, White Bear Lake has a partnership with Tamarack Nature Center. Um, and then there was All Seasons Preschool was started right around, it was a little bit before um, we had started. So that one is in a retirement community home uh, apartment center. And so they have the preschool, it's an intergenerational preschool. And so they have that, but otherwise it, that was kind of it for the three kind of main ones in Minnesota. And now it has, you know, absolutely exploded. So I don't even know, we haven't really done an official audit in terms of numbers of what it is, but I know in like the Duluth area alone, there's at least 10 programs that identify themselves as being a nature-based preschool program. Yeah, I was so excited to go on those tours. Like, I think it was going to be the end of June or something, and then all the COVID stuff happened, but that sounded like such a cool opportunity. Yes. Hopefully in fall, if all goes well, we'll be able to do that, those tours, because that's a really neat opportunity, because really with nature-based preschools, originally it was something that um, people associated with nature centers, and it was mostly nature centers that were doing them creating them. And then over time, as uh, others have learned about the philosophy and become familiar with that, they've been able to adapt it into a variety of settings. So up in Duluth is a great example because you have your classic Hartley Nature Preschool environments, but then you can go to the Secret Forest Preschool, which is a classroom in adjacent. It's on a church property um, that they're using for that. Summer in homes like Wind Ridge Schoolhouse is in a home environment. And so they've got lots. And then there's the little barnyard is on a farm, a hobby farm. So all these different environments that they have to be able to see lots of different ways that you can incorporate that nature-based preschool philosophy. It doesn't need to be a nature center per se, and it doesn't necessarily need to be those wild uh, forests that we often think about and associate. Yeah, absolutely. It's just being outside and exposing them to everything around them and the natural happenings around them. I mean, at your school, it sounds like you guys are doing it every single day. Like, are you outside no matter the weather? We are. So we do have, being in a school district, we have a few weather constraints that come from the school district policies. But even with that, that's changed. When I started, um, the kind of mindset for the early childhood program was 10 degrees. So if it was colder than 10, we couldn't go outside. And in Minnesota, that could be, and actually that year, it was the uh, polar vortex year when schools were canceled, like, I think 10 days out of the year. So if you take that mindset, to, the access to outdoors is not going to be very frequent. But 
we were able to have some conversations. And again, it really helps to have those other established programs, reaching out to them to understand, okay, what is your weather policy? How do you help um, navigate some of the challenges or concerns that might come with that? So we reduced it to zero degrees. And then it was, again, I think we had another cold streak in the district. And so the district moved its whole, even for recess policy to negative five. And then um, further kind of conversations from that and the nature preschool programs, because our children are going to have the gear, uh, whether they actually have it with them or we provide it, depending on the situation, if a child forgets gear or if a family's not able to afford the gear, we, we do have extras. So we're taking that into consideration. And then we are all trained on um, early signs of frostbite. So understanding what does frost nip look like? And then, um, you know, obviously you respond before you even get to that frostbite stage, but we know what to do in the events that um, something should happen and a child should start to get signs of frostbite for treatment. The other piece too is finding what are those tools for reading the weather and how do we know? And so the National Weather Service has an outdoor wind chill guide. And so we use that and it actually gives you the amount of time that you could be outside with exposed skin before frostbite occurs. So we're aware of what those time limit and constraints are and are really intentional about that too. So it's not about forcing the children to spend time outside because we're in nature preschool, we're gonna get out there in all weather, but more so um, reading them and being aware of them and their comfort level. And there are some days when they are just not, it's not something that they're into that day and that's okay. And so being flexible and being able to shift and say, okay, let's go inside and find out, you know, have other activities continue to extend our learning in the, in the indoor environment. So being, being flexible with that is key. But I think, think about my uh, kind of previous couple of years with nature preschool. And I want to say a lot of our first days, unfortunately have been downpour days. You just, crazy downpours and I have a video of the children the one day I had opened the door and it was the downpour had just started it was kind of a drizzle before and looking at their faces and they're all looking at each other like what in the world does she think we're doing like we're not going out there and um so they slowly started walking out the door and I just simply opened the door and they slowly started going and then one little guy in the back of the line as they were kind of coming out the door runs around everybody else and goes straight for this puddle and just dove into the puddle and is jumping up and down everyone's kind of looking at each other and then their faces all broke out into a smile and everybody was in the puddle I and after that, it. It, just, yeah, it was exactly what you wanted to see but just watching their initial reactions to go from this look of like she's crazy I, I want to go home <laughs> I'm not doing this to just pure joy and and um, finding that connection for them and seeing that. And then those crazy rainy days, some of those cold days were some of our most memorable times outside. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that can translate to adults so much too, because if you were to take a group of adults outside in pouring rain, they would look at you like you're crazy too and wouldn't want to go out there. So, I mean, to do this with young children at ages four and five is clearly the best time to do it because if they're excited to do it when they're four and five, chances are that's going to translate into their adolescence and into their adulthood. <laughs> that's exactly right. And even there are days when I have to check myself too, when I'm like, ah, you know, it'd be easier just to stay inside or it's not one of those you know, beautiful, sunny days, it's foggy and gloomy and kind of chilly. Uh, but just remembering too of if you let those barriers prevent you from going out and you start to really look at life, most days aren't those really sunny, beautiful days. And so you're, you're losing out on those opportunities. And um, that kind of seeing the joy in the children and seeing their experiences reminds me to find that too within those gloomy, not, not ideal weather days. And um, like I said, our, some of my favorite memories have been those days and, you know, playing in the, a mud pit and having someone start, you know, face painting with mud and those, you know, it's all about those relationships and, and in those moments where the joy is happening, those relationships between with me and them and with each other are so much stronger. And so it just fosters this really tight knit community and, and there's nothing I have ever seen or experienced in kind of those traditional classroom environments where I've been able to recreate that or see that to the same level as I have in the nature-based preschool program. Absolutely. And I know like in Linda's book, There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather, one huge thing she talks about is just like the resilience that being outside with her own children has brought them and has taught them self-confidence. Because like when you're put in a situation of like digging in the mud or like 
trying to walk on an icy patch. You are gaining so much self-confidence and learning so much about your own self and your own body during those times versus being in a classroom where you're maybe sitting half the time. There's so much that people are learning and these kids aren't even realizing it. They're having the time of their lives. And I think too, even with the resilience, but then also that empathy and realizing that you can reach out to each other, you know, notice what's happening when you can't see a friend that has been trying to get on that big rock every single day and hasn't had success. They, they realize that and they're aware of that. And so they'll be willing to give up their chance and spot on the rock to come back down and boost their friend up. And you just can't, you know, teach that uh, unless they have those real experiences and and then seeing your friend's response when you do that their big face of smile and their thank you and that appreciation and then it, it just continues to fuel those um, types of behaviors that you want to see through that real experience of doing it exactly it's real life situations it's not like this algorithm or worksheet where kids are sitting down and being drilled it's just natural happenings so when a parent sends their kids to a school like this, like they're, they probably already expect that they're going to be outside all the time, but what does like a daily schedule look like for you guys? Do you do like traditional like circle times outside? What's that like? Yeah. So, well, one thing with the parents, I, I always find it interesting because the first, you know, the rainy day, whether it's first day of school or the first time it's raining, I'll often get a text or an email saying, so you're probably staying inside today, right? And I'm like, well, no, if you remember, we use that motto. There's no such thing as bad weather. So even though they sign up for it, we do a, lots of orientations and things like that. Prior to them coming, we do a spring one right after they register. We do again one again in the fall right before school starts. So even that, they still don't fully grasp what, what, we, what we're doing. Um, but our schedule is we try to spend as much time outside. So we, in a full day program, that's shifted things a little bit. And uh, one of those things is because they have breakfast in the full day program. We know that they have to go to the bathroom after about 30 minutes or so after having breakfast. So we actually do start our day inside for the full day program for that very reason. So it just gives the children a chance to come into the room. We do a little quick kind of morning meeting where we talk about things that happened the day before and kind of set the stage for um, what we think might be happening outside for the day. And we might have, usually what we do is we have an activity or an idea of something we're going to do with them. 99.9% .9 of the time that activity goes out the door the second we step outside because they see something that we weren't able to plan for. So nature really does provide the curriculum. And um, as the teacher, it's more of being having an idea if we need it, but being flexible with really observing the children and noticing what's happening in the environment around them and being willing to shift um, and adapt to that. So after we do kind of our morning meeting, we go to the bathroom, gear up, and that's a life skill right there. A lot of programs, I think the barrier is the time. Oh, it's going to take too much time to get the children transitioned to go outside. But if you do it every day, they are rock stars at getting ready on their own. We have visuals to help them be independent with that. But to watch them checking each other to make sure their boots are up tight and their liners on the outside of their boots or their neck scarf is under their um, jacket to see that helping process too, that they take care of each other that way um, is amazing. It's amazing to see that. And there's so many life skills that are happening in that moment. It's worth it. It's worth that time. It's not wasted time. It's learning time. And then once we head outside, we typically will have a conversation during our morning meeting and decide where we're going to go play. So we do name the play places and those spaces stay named that way because that helps with the sense of place, developing a sense of place, fostering that with the children and their, their um, places at Jeffers Pond and that environment. But it also is for safety reasons so that the front office knows if something happens and we're out at Chickadee Landing or the old squirrel tree where that location is. So um, we have already decided before we go outside where we think we're going to go. And usually that just simply means are we going to go left on the path or are we going to go right? And then we'll either cro cross the creek or we'll go right and then we go across the dock uh, that goes across another spot. So being the property is so big, we have to kind of have that mindset of which area we're going to go to. And then after that, it really depends on the children. So we might do an organized activity of today we've got our color swatches and we're going to notice the different color changes that are happening and try to find colors that match that. But other times it's simply we're going to start walking and having conversations about what we're seeing and um, observing 
And then that just adds and fuels on to what happens after that. So the main thing we have to do is just know the early childhood standards. And if we know those standards, we can integrate that into anything. So if it's a counting standard, if it's finding acorns or counting the bug's legs, um, counting how many birds you see on the, or ducks on the pond. So we could just embed that into anything. So the activity itself isn't what's important that I had planned. It's more about the kind of standards I was thinking that we were going to be working on, but the activity can change based on what the children are seeing and doing. And then we're out for up to three hours. We return for lunch and then we do our rest time indoors. And afternoon for the full day program, it really depends on the children. Some programs try to get their children back outside, but I've taken the philosophy of letting them kind of decide. If they're not in the mood to go back out, I'm not going to make them gear up right after they rested and put their stuff on and head back out. Um, we'll do things in the classroom, but we adapt the same approach of this open-ended, child-driven uh, play that is during that time. So they really have, again, the ability to use materials in creative ways and um, pursue their interests in the indoor environment. Well, and I think that's so powerful just to like to bring them outside and kind of let them be learning on their own rather than because when you're inside, sometimes it's a forced thing with kids in preschool and at any age, really, especially in elementary. I mean, forcing it is when learning becomes not fun and that's the last thing you want for kids so to bring them outside for three hours at a time and just let them explore an adventure they're learning so much and like you said you just have to kind of like know the early childhood standards and I would assume that you're just kind of like taking like notes or like taking pictures to track their progress on that yeah so we do a lot of observational based assessments so it's a lot through pictures or jotting down notes of what we observe with different skills the students are exhibiting and then we do share that so a big piece of it with, with parents and trying to build that comfort level with the nature preschool program is they are going to want to know what what's happening outside you know what, what are you guys doing during your day and if they're not seeing things coming home like physical tangible maybe worksheets or things like that they, they they need to see something else and to recognize and to understand what's happening and when they ask their children they often get the answer just like in a traditional classroom i don't know or i can't remember um and so what we do is we use seesaw and that's an online digital portfolio and we post a daily update so that update's going to say which play places we visited what kind of key observations did we make um, did anything else happen? You know, one day we came across a garter snake eating the little baby toads, toadlets out in the forest and we watched it one right after another and I have never seen anything like that and to see that with the children was amazing and we sat there for 25-30 minutes just watching the snake and it would take a rest and then it would move on and find another one and so we um, documented that on a video, shared that with families and it's really neat to see because when you are sharing these tangible evidence of the photos, um, the, the text itself is great, you know, so families know what kind of questions. I always usually will try to give them prompts too of like what kind of questions they might uh, be able to ask to engage a conversation with their child versus the open-ended, what did you do today? So that they have something to work off of and that helps the children realize that their parents have some information and are engaged in that conversation and then they'll be more willing to um, kind of share what they did or experienced and then uh, families will often reply and say, oh, my son had to show everybody that snake video. You know, we've watched this 30 times. And to see that connection is really powerful because it, it builds that homeschool connection that we know is really important in early childhood and all education, that the families are engaged in the learning. They're sharing what's happening at home. We're sharing what's happening at school. And it's that back and forth that um, all in the interest of supporting the child. Well, absolutely. And I think what's so cool about homeschool connection and nature school is that families can take what you guys are doing at a nature school and easily do that in their own backyard. I mean, or just at a nature trail near their house. They don't need all of this academic stuff to do what you're doing in nature preschool. They're making observations and talking about things like any parent can go do that with a kid. It's something so simple. And I think, especially during quarantine, a lot of parents started to realize that outdoors is a perfect place to be learning. That's exactly right. Yeah, it is. And you know, that they realize their children need to move. They need to be physically active. And the outdoor environment provides that springboard for catching their interest in something and their curiosity and that's just going to fuel the learning. So if a child is engaged in the activity or engaged in what they're seeing 
and experiencing, and then they are going to be curious about it. And they're going to want to know more. They're going to start asking questions. And if they're engaged in it, they're going to want to find the answers out to those questions. So that's going to lead to, you know, going to the library and finding books about that topic or looking on the computer for in more information. And that's going to, then the conversation is just going to keep going from there. So um, I kind of tell parents, you know, when I describe the key takeaways for my philosophy for education, one is to have children find a love for school, like find a love for school and being at school and learning. And that is going to come into being able to think, like ask questions, wonder about things, and then come up with your own ideas about answers to those questions. Even if it's something you don't know what the answer might be, why is the sky blue? That's a really hard question to find an answer to, but they can come up with ideas and theories about that. And then what I often do is back off on giving the answers to that, you know, so I don't correct them. It's more of having a conversation about what they think and why they think that, and then giving them time and space. And they'll eventually continue circling back to those same questions and add new information and new answers. And they'll change their answer as they get that new information. And that's what we really want to see children to be flexible in their thinking and be able to adapt what they're thinking based on the new information they get. And that's a life skill. That's something you know, as adults we need to be able to do. And it, it starts early and early on. And when they come to my classroom, oftentimes they already have that mindset of teacher has the answers. They're just going to tell me what to do. And it's usually that first two weeks is a kind of a struggle because I totally step back and, well, you know, where do you want to sit in the classroom? You could sit anywhere on the carpet. I'm not going to assign you a spot. Or when we're outside, um, what do you want to do with that, you know, stick that you found? And really leaving it open-ended and helping them. They struggle in it, but giving them space to struggle because once it connects with them, they take off. And by the end of the year, it is amazing to be in the forest with them because I feel like I don't even need to be there. I could be stepped back and they would be able to navigate the forest safely with all the rules that we have. And there are rules out there. It's not just you know, free for all, Lord of the Flies style in the forest. Um, we do put safety parameters to keep them safe. So they, they learn those things. And those are again, all life skills of if you're gonna climb a tree, it has to be alive. Um, you have to test the branches and for us being out there, they have to ask first so that we are there part of that process. Um, we figure out what, what's your plan? Where do you want to climb on the tree? Let's look at the branches. Does it look safe? And so they go through that risk assessment process. And then too, they're um, able to take that skill with them as they go on. That's a skill for anywhere, whether they're getting behind a car at 16, you have to go through that risk assessment process and to have a strong foundation of the consequences. If I don't do this, and I don't take these safety measures, then there is going to be a consequence. So they learn that in small ways when you are starting to run with a stick and you trip. Oh, that's not a safe choice to make. We walk with sticks. And so they, they learn those things. I mean, again, small, safe scale where the risk of injury is very minimal. At least the, the risk of a severe injury is very minimal. And so by having that foundation, then they're going to have those life skills to, as they continue on. Yeah. I mean, just hearing that flexibility and adaptation, I mean, those are huge life skills that you, you can't just teach in a classroom. It's not a black and white thing. And unfortunately, a lot of the education system is still very black and white. And when kids are out in the world on their own, they are looking for wrong or right. And they don't have that way of thinking. So I just love what you guys are doing at the nature preschool. And there's a lot of other cool nature preschools out there. So awesome to hear what you guys are doing there. Um, so how many classrooms are there? So we've got three um, educators that have been teaching the nature preschool program. And um, this past year, it was two full day sections and I think two half day sections. And so that's fluctuated through the years, depending on interest and then also space. So uh, being in a public school, we, you know, the, the K-5 elementary students, you know, we need to have space for those programming. So the amount of classroom and offerings that we have for preschool changes based on what we have for that. So, um, but overall, you know, that the interest is continuing to grow. And I think with COVID-19 and what we're seeing with research, 
about outdoors being safer for children. And also then parents spending more time outside with their children in the last couple of months and realizing their child enjoys this. It is going to, I think, continue to fuel some growth in the nature-based preschool programming. I absolutely think so too. There's been so many articles out there the past few months and I'm just like rooting for all those articles. It's so awesome to see all the research coming out of this. And I'm sure you're just like, nerding out as and much yes. about it as me. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that it's not going to be so far out there. And I think oftentimes uh, for schools to think about what is this nature preschool and you associate it with this wild free for all in the woods. But when you really spend time recognizing and understanding what um, the philosophy is and what's really happening in those interactions, you start to see all the learning that's happening and, and the value and recognize the value of that. And so we are seeing, you know, in Pirate Lake had the environmental education kind of uh, initiative already, but what that looked like, I think has changed over the years, but now from just having the nature preschool program at an elementary school, the kindergarten teachers are going out on a regular basis, sometimes daily, but they for sure try to get what they call wilderness Wednesdays one day of immersing the children in the outdoor environment for some nature play, but also that exploration and discovery time. We partner with our preschools with the fifth grade classroom. So once a week, we are with our fifth grade buddies outside doing, uh, it's fifth grade standards that we're covering, but we're doing activities that incorporate the preschoolers. So it's really neat to see that interaction, the fifth graders with the preschoolers. And oftentimes the preschoolers are the experts because that environment, they are so familiar and comfortable with what they're seeing and observing. And um, the fifth graders are learning from them in that process. That's really incredible to hear. I mean, yeah, because those kids are the ones that are out there every single day. And their observations they make, those preschoolers, their minds are just so different. You know, they haven't had all these experiences shifting their mind. And so when they're outside, they're making observations in ways and their, their ideas that they're sharing are so unique compared to what the fifth graders are doing. So seeing them have to, fifth graders have ideas and making observations, the preschoolers offering this totally different perspective and then bringing it together and seeing them try to compromise on when it comes to taking those things and coming up with an activity or an outcome together, they have to do that compromising process. So it's really neat to see the preschoolers challenging the fifth graders, the fifth graders challenging the preschoolers and what that outcome ends up being. Well, absolutely. It's like a little childhood workplace in all reality. I mean, because it's people coming from totally different perspectives and trying to work together. And another perfect example of real world experiences that you guys are giving these preschoolers. That's yeah. And, and it too, it's, you know, sometimes experience, you know, more exp life experience leads to great things, but then sometimes that can hinder. And so to see see that in process. One of my favorite stories was uh, one of the students we were doing a squirrel enrichment project. So they were trying to design squirrel feeders that would challenge the squirrels mentally or physically to get their food. And one of the preschoolers wanted to hang the feeder. So he wanted it to be suspended. So they're in a field and the preschooler is telling the fifth grader, well, just, just hang it. I want it to be, you know, hang it. And they're like, well, what am I going to hang it from? And they're like, the sky just hang it, just hang it from the sky. And so the little preschooler has tape and is giving it to the fifth grader, telling them to hang it from the sky and to watch the fifth grader try to grapple with this impossible task. <laughs> like, I can't do this. And so finally, the student in working through that, and we stayed back and you could see that frustration comes out, um, but we kind of stayed back in the perimeter, ready to step in and help if, if needed. But the fifth grader was able to kind of take a step back it was like, it, this doesn't work. And finally she lifted it up and then just dropped it to show the preschooler, like there's nothing to hang it from. And then the aha moment of the preschooler. And he was like, well, put it on the tree over there. <laughs> so he put it off in the distance. And so he was thinking like, no, well that you hang it from a tree. But she was thinking like right here in this moment, you want me to hang it and there's nothing to hang it from. So it's just really neat to see those interactions and be able to observe that. Right, right. Like the problem solving versus like the very literal way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes. many opportunities out there. So tell us a little bit about this Facebook group you created, the Early Childhood Outdoors group. Yeah, so that came out um, 
three years, maybe four years ago now, three years ago, it was the Minnesota Early Childhood Outdoors, Minico, and it came out of a Dodge Nature Preschool had hosted the Natural Start Conference. And so that's a national conference held once a year. And so at that conference, a bunch of Minnesota educators are hanging out after one of the social hours. And we're all looking around thinking, why haven't we gotten together? Why don't we get together more often? and collaborate and network and support each other, being that we're all in the same geographic location. And again, even there's even differences from Duluth to where we are in the Twin Cities area, but at least to have some concept, okay, what does the four seasons look like in Minnesota? What are some challenges that we have in Minnesota that are really different from what Florida experiences or Washington experiences and to be able to support each other. So we were able to start that. It was a group of nature preschool teachers that got together to start that. Uh, with the Jeffers Foundation. So they provided some kind of um, initial support in terms of a networking. They had a membership database that they've had over the years from their trainings. So we were able to share it with them. Um, but then they've also provided meals. So every meeting that we have, we do four meetings a year and they provide a lunch to make sure that we are able to continue to network and collaborate during that time instead of having educators going off to grab food somewhere or having to bring their own meals and worry about that. And then um, our philosophy has been that the experts are within the states. You know, we all have something to give. Even though we might be new to the journey, we have something that we're able to bring to the table to share with others. And so we try to keep it free and we have been successful at doing that. We rotate where we go. And each site has offered their site for free, knowing that the next month or the next um, season one, they're going to send their staff to that and they're going to benefit from having someone else hosted for free. So that's been a really neat opportunity to have that a free professional development by people that are just passionate about nature-based education. And then we don't want to be restrictive to those that aren't maybe fully nature-based um, or I think of themselves as nature preschools or even just preschools. So we have created it for early childhood. So we encourage anyone, infants to third grade teachers who are interested in incorporating any kind of element of nature or just even learning about it to be able to come to these events. And the group has kind of taken off. We have over 600, I think, followers on Facebook and our events have been averaging from 50 to 100 people. And then up in Duluth, we had 200 people register for one of them. So it's been really neat to see that, again, that just that overall interest and having a space for people to come learn about what is this and to be able to leave and take something away, whether it is, I'm going to become a full nature preschool or I'm just going to add natural loose parts to my playground. Everyone can find a way to connect and find something that is relevant to them at these meetings. And then that group has kind of morphed in the last couple of weeks or months with uh, COVID-19 is we recognized kind of before the research had officially come out that the outdoors was a safer environment, just thinking kind of, okay, if you're a child care provider and you are in a home and you're a home child care provider and children are coming into your home and families are coming into your home and they may have been exposed to the virus, you're now inducing that into your home environment. And that is stressful for providers to think about. So we started thinking, uh, Laura Whitaker had the initial idea and was like, we have to do something something to share our knowledge and expertise about how they can continue providing childcare, but do so in their backyard. And maybe that'll alleviate some of the stress for the provider um, and provide a, even a safer environment for all the children that will be participating in the program. So we created a three toolkits and it continued to evolve as more people got in, into it. Um, it started with just the initial family childcare providers. Now we have a preschool and childcare center toolkit and then a school age childcare uh, program toolkit. So thinking about those that are running it out of public schools, charter schools or private schools that have those before and after care programs um, and summer programs that they kind of adapting it for them. And so what it does is it talks about some of those things we kind of touch base on safety. What does that look like outside planning for the weather? gear, uh, how to get gear, or what gear should they have, and then activities. What are some things that you could start doing while you're getting acclimated with kind of transitioning to more child-led, um, if you need some kind of structure to your activity, what are some good um, activities that are nature related that you could do with your students. And is that a free resource that they can find on the Facebook group? It is. Yep. If you go to the Facebook group, it should be the top pin post. And if it's not, I'll pin it there. And um, you've, we ask that people fill out a Google form 
just so we can track who's using it because it now has been kind of been shared uh, nationally with different programs. And so we're just kind of curious of who's using it, but we also want to keep people looped in as we add new things. So one of the most recent things we just added was a professional development document. And looking back through old webinars that are out there already on different topics related to nature-based education, um, a one like go-to one-stop shop place for people to start getting that, to start giving themselves professional development on different topics that they might be interested in. So that was a recent thing. So then I was able to go contact everyone on that I have emails for and let them know of that new edition. And it's a working document. So there, they are Google uh, documents and we continue adding to them as we're able to do so. And as we get new resources to share. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad that you're advocating for this and have this group where people can go because especially like you said, with COVID, like so many people had to make changes and especially those in-home daycare families that don't have a ton of resources they need a group to network with that's exactly right yep that's that's exactly what we were hoping to do is to just to provide support and um help them become comfortable with this concept of hey we spend a little bit of time outside what would that look like to spend even more time outside? And what, what are things that we need to be considering? Well, I know you have to get off soon here, but is there any other groups that you're involved with or things you wanted to touch on that we missed? You know, I think the main thing is if you're an elementary person and you're interested in this, check out the Jeffers Foundation. They do workshops. I know they have um, some this summer about kind of uh, team teaching with mother nature is their workshop. And it's just, again, some introduction activities and things to do as an educator to start making those connections. And then check out the Minico. We, um, when you're on the Facebook page, we do have Facebook groups. So if you wanna engage in some more back and forth with others. And then Natural Start Alliance is a wonderful organization that's been holding regular forms for people. And so those were Zoom discussions where they can connect with each other and hear from somebody on a topic and then have some time in a small group setting. And they're gonna be gearing up uh, for their National Nature Preschool Conference is gonna be online this year. And it will be at the end of the last week in July. So check that out. They are same thing that they're geared towards for a full early childhood. So they have um, things for infants, toddlers, preschool, and then thinking about those early elementary uh, grades as well. So that's a great place. And uh, this conference will be an excellent way to just start learning more about it. If that's something that's interesting to you. Awesome. And it should be interesting to everyone because that might be the life that we're going to be living for a while. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, I'll say that um, anyone who's heard me kind of talk, there's a TED talk that I really like to refer to and it's Emma Maris and it's nature is everywhere. We just need to learn to see it. And I think one of the first things people think about is why well, I don't have natural area in my schoolyard or in my home or um, in my city. And, and that's not true. We are part of nature. And I think it's really important that we start to see ourselves as being part of nature and recognizing the natural world that is right outside our door and seeing that connection with it. And then the other one is uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is a wonderful book and it is written by an indigenous woman. She's a botanist as well. And so she was talking about as growing up as a Native American child and hearing the stories from her grandparents about plants and her parents about plants, and then having this interest and then going into botany and um, blending the world. And it has totally changed my perspective of kind of science, um, recognizing all this knowledge in um, the indigenous people about plants and, and animals that in the natural world that we haven't really realized or we've kind of dismissed, but we need to get connected back with. So that's a wonderful resource um, as well to check out. Awesome. I love like that it's bringing in more diversity too. It is. And it's, she's a storyteller and I recommend the audiobook because her storytelling is captivating. And so I have both the written the text as well as the audiobook, and I've listened to it many times. It's wonderful. Even just in short, you don't have to listen to it all the way through. You can even take it chapter chunks at a time and it's fascinating, but it, she captivates you with her storytelling ability. Awesome. Well, thank you, Anna. This has been super, super inspiring to have you on and it makes me excited to get outside with kids again when that time comes, when the school year starts again. <laughs> that's, well, that's right. And that's what we hope to see. You know, I, it's something that I've been able to experience and see the benefits. And it's something that I would love to see for every child. So it's an opportunity with COVID it, potentially to see that ha actually happening. So I'm excited about a silver lining um, to the pandemic. Yes, perfect. And we will be sure to link um, all of those websites that you mentioned in our show notes as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me. This is great. Yeah, it was. Thank you so much.
So I've loved these interviews that we've been doing with preschool educators and outdoor advocates for children because I'm a huge advocate for play, getting outdoors with young kids. And speaking to Anna was just another reminder that getting outside with kids doesn't need to be like a big extravaganza. It's really just, like she said, giving them opportunities to interact with their environment. And at our preschool, I know I've said this in podcasts before, I'm so proud of the fact that we do get kids outside every single day. And I hope that more preschools start to do that. I think it's something that you just said too. It's not that hard. Like kids are kids. I guess what I'm trying to say, when they go out, they're not as concerned as us adults that are like, okay, I need to make sure that I don't get wet. I don't get muddy. I don't, you know, I think there's a learned behavior kind of, we can't like get messy, you know, and as kids, they just want to go out and play. And I think that Anna mentioned a few times in this podcast, and I know that you're an advocate for too, is when kids go out and play, even though they may not, it may not look like structured learning, they are learning. And this fun type of learning, the things that you can do with your surroundings to get to those, I guess, um, competencies and goals for learning when they're out having fun and playing they're going to enjoy that better and they're going to be more attentive and they totally are when they're outside learning it's not only like cognitive learning but think about what they're doing for their physical bodies they are climbing they are moving they are jumping they are running they're walking on tree roots and rocks that's so needed for your body And they're interacting with each other a lot more, I feel like. And I'm not a preschool teacher, but I would imagine indoors, in a classroom setting, you don't have as much interaction because it is a bit more structured and you might be sitting around in a circle or something and maybe not interacting as much as you would be in a more playful, natural setting. Yeah, like a more unstructured environment. And when you think about it, our world is often run on more unstructured times and environments. So a child needs to learn from the start how to interact in an unstructured environment. And it's a good problem-solving environment too, because there are times when you deal with different sorts of weather when you're outside or you're dealing with the various landscapes around you kid falls and gets a scrape a bird comes by and poops on you just little things that problems are going to come up but the more those kids are exposed to those the more resilient you will be later on and i really like the example too of when Anna said that they have this thing where the preschoolers and fifth graders kind of get together and have this this time out there where the, the fifth graders are kind of mentoring, yet the preschoolers are also mentoring each other in a way. And that example she gave of when the fifth grader was looking for a place to hang the birdhouse. I believe it was a birdhouse or a bird or squirrel feeder, one of those. Yeah, it was a birdhouse and like the fifth grader like didn't. There wasn't anything around and then the preschooler says just hang it from the sky. And it's kind of that funny moment of like inside a preschooler's mind, they're not really thinking about like those really tangible like, okay, I have to have an object. They're just thinking, oh, there's something above you. It's the sky. You can just hang it up there. And then the fifth grader has a teaching moment there where they're like well you can't really hang it from there because the sky doesn't really have anything to attach to so then the preschooler is like oh it clicks a little bit like oh yeah you have to have a solid object for it to hang from yeah so they were both learning from each other and it just there's so many innovative moments that you can have when you're outdoors without extreme classroom structure. 
So I hope the more that nature preschools start to open up in the USA and in Minnesota, more people start to see them differently and see the benefits of them. And I think with the pandemic that's been going on and the advantages of getting outdoors and not being surrounded inside by larger groups of people, it may open up this opportunity for schools to try new approaches to learning. And hopefully this nature-based education starts um, taking off or at least um, getting some more interest. Yeah, and the Minnesota Eco Group that Anna started, um, she just reminded people that there's something for everybody on there, whether you are a huge nature lover or just starting out your path as a nature lover. Educators of all levels can find something for their classroom on there. Yeah, so we'll have a link to that Facebook group in the description of this episode, as well as some more information about Jeffers Pond Nature School where Anna's currently working. So make sure to get your students and kids outdoors this school year, and thanks for listening. We love sharing these stories with you through the Hiking Through Life podcast, and we're so grateful that you listen to this podcast. If you'd like to support the Hiking Through Life podcast further, we have these amazing new t-shirts and water bottles. The t-shirts come in four colors, and the water bottles are perfect for trails, adventuring, or daily use. Consider checking them out at hikingthroughlife.net slash shop. Use the code podcast and receive 10% off your first order. You've been listening to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Peace, love, and hike through life.